And now the question is, so what do we do instead? So let's try to cut, cut to the chase. And, uh, Uh, right. Right, so now, just in case you didn't quite get it, uh, Heidegger feels the need to lay it in you one more time. So, um, mm -hmm. indulge him. Uh, Can't submit this clause. We just finished uh, the previous paragraph. Can submit the next. <coughs> yes. Anyone? Within its purview, that of objects, the compelling knowledge of science has already annihilated the thing as thing long before the atomic bomb exploded. The explosion of the atomic bomb is only the crudest of all crude confirmations of an annihilation of things that occurred long ago. Confirmation that the thing as thing remains nullified. The, anni the annihilation is so uncanny because it brings with it a twofold delusion. Yeah, we need to care of it. For one, the opinion that science, more so than all other experience, would encounter them together. Their unity, however, is determined by the pouring out we to be not getting the That's just finished the sentence. Their unity, however, is determined by the pouring out to which the jug as jug is correlated. Okay. So, you see, he could not resist bringing the nuclear holocaust in one more time. Um, so, what is he saying here? <clears throat> he basically says, uh, you don't really have to laugh. Uh, with these guys. The Copernic knowledge of science has already adhered the thing as thing long before the atomic bomb exploded. How do you hear that? You see, he was a very angry man. It seems like one week to another. Well, yes, but, but in a sense he says that what does it mean to say that the atomic bomb already exploded? Or like the annihilation happened long before the atomic bomb. How do you hear that? How do you make sense of this statement? That the annihilation has already happened. He says that the explosion of the atomic bomb is only the crudest of all crude confirmations of an annihilation of things that occurred long time ago. Because the moment I talk about annihilation, I'm already uh, affirming that it is an annihilation. Not exactly, but if you are on the right track, you just it's not the moment you talk about annihilation. It's something slightly different. Anyone has any hint? <coughs> any well, hint? he's using that almost as a metaphor for the power of science, you know, not to make us not look at things as they are. That's right. It's just it's not a metaphor, not for Heidegger. For Heidegger, when the annihilation begins, at what point the annihilation happens for real? Science. Right, so to be, be more specific, when? Science, yes, but what kind of science? When you separate yourself from That's the world. That's right, yeah. The, when you separate yourself from the world, when the world becomes an object to you, and you, you learn about the world as a picture, when the world is separated from you, and that is happening with, let's say, the Descartes statement, I think, therefore I am, not I love, therefore I am, or I feel, therefore I am, you know, it could have different, or I, I'm alive, therefore I am, or I am, therefore I am, I think, therefore I am, and thinking has the quality of representing entities in the world to the mind. The moment you conceive of the world as a representation, the moment you think of the world as a picture, the moment the world becomes a picture, the world is already annihilated to you. Yeah? The world is already annihilated. Um, and the atomic bomb itself is, in a sense, a direct result of this annihilation. This, this separation, this is what required for the rational thinking to commence. For rational, the moment rational thinking begins its work, its amazing 
work of accumulating knowledge and advancing science. The separation between us and the world is established. And us, in a sense, as we learn about the world more and more and get more in command of the world, at the same time, the separation between us and the world grows. So we get, you know, there was time when the human being felt absolutely crushed by the powers of nature. You know, when we would sit huddling together around the fire if we were lucky, or just in a dark cave, and there would be storm raging outside, and we would be just terrified, and we would never know if we would, you know, leave to see the morning. You know, and we would feel, you know, uh, this time is speck, it can be crushed by the forces of nature at any minute. That's what Heidegger speaks about when we saw, we saw yesterday, about this need for certainty and security. And so, we learn how to control these elements. We build our houses, we keep our fire, we, we build cities, we build walls. Uh, we learn how to control all these forces of nature in order to protect ourselves. And as we do that, as we gradually move even beyond controlling these forces of nature, we also learn how to harness them for our own use. So we build a dam over a river and we harness this force of water gushing down the river and we generate energy and we store it in our batteries and we light our cities at night with this power that now is serving us as we gradually put ourselves in control of the world, we also continuously separate ourselves from the world. And this act of separation is also an annihilation, Heidegger says. So, of course, and it is not, it's not uninteresting that this advancement of knowledge, so we learn how to uh, harness the river and produce electricity uh, through the hy hy hydraulic dam. But we also learn how to harness the power of the atom and produce electricity through uh, nuclear fusion. And also, uh, as a byproduct, or maybe not a byproduct, um, we learn how to make the atomic bomb or the, um, um, what is that one? Uh, uh, the hydrogen bomb, yeah. Uh, that supposedly can annihilate everything besides the feelings in our teeth. So, uh, so here's the story, you know. Yes, we got so good at controlling nature that we even developed a device that can and will erase all of us from the face of the planet. That's what our efforts at getting control led us to. And Heidegger says, yes, this is true. And it's kind of trivial to say that this advancement of science also led to the greatest danger. But he says, the atomic bomb, in a sense, it's trivial because it, the annihilation began at the moment when you took the world as an object of your study. It was already there. It was already built in. Yeah? Yes? Um, I don't know if this is a step back, but um, could you not say that there could be some kind of a true or non-annihilating understanding of things if you understand your own comprehension is never finite, but it's always lacking? Because whatever it is, how do you understand that? Like, if there is always a lack, so it will always be true. Yes. So there is. So, so understanding is never complete. And yes. But if you can understand that you're representing something, there is always a lack. Then that is never finite. Then whatever you're representing it, whatever the lack is, that's always true because there is always that lack. And and. How that fits within the story? Because he's taking it as finite, he's saying that we understand the object you represent it as through yeah. even calling it an object. But at the same time, I mean, most people can still conceive of its existence outside of itself. And can we? I think we do. Automatically, our language has to reduce things, so we can't express that because our language already it simplifies it into words, which it's not. Anyone has any thoughts on that? 
You are saying, if I hear you correctly, that Heidegger is uh, wrong to say that our relationship to things is purely representation. I think that you could say that potentially some ways of having a I think like, okay. I, I think that I, I, I get it. I think um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Heidegger is not saying that our relationship to things is purely representation. In fact, he's saying almost the opposite. But what he does say is that the scientific way of grasping things is purely representation. He is also saying, one second, that our experience of things is completely different from the scientific. What we cannot find is for, for science, he doesn't see a way for science to incorporate the lived experience within it. Science always remains oblivious to what the jug really means in the context of a dinner when it is on the table. Science only interested in replacing one volume with another volume. Yeah? And if you have been to a physics class, then you probably had to do these equations with swimming pools filling with water, you know, or pipes, you know, and no one asks, you know, but who going to swim them, you know, in what neighborhood? It's kind of not the right question. Yeah, I remember there was a famous um, experiment, in sociological experiment, when um, engineering students were asked to um, design a pipeline, it was an exam, uh, to carry blood from Newcastle to London. So they all basically sat, you know, with the rulers and, and, and calculated, you know, the, the proper diameter. And no one asked, why would you need them? Uh, well, a, a black pudding factory or... Uh, no one asked, you know, which is kind of interesting. Um, also, tells, also goes a lot to talk about um, to what Hannah Arendt calls the banality of evil. This banality of evil, which we will speak about in, 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 other, in other context, um, is somehow connected with this, you know, it's a rational question, we can find a rational answer to it, and everything else is irrelevant. But of course it is relevant, it is kind of relevant that yesterday some people were saying, and again you get it is kind of we passed some kind of threshold in terms of the uh, contamination of the atmosphere. I don't remember how many particles, but it will kind of pass to another point of no return. Um, so you sort of come to a point where the scientific progress seems to be in direct uh, conflict with life. And you sort of forced to take a step back and say, oops, thanks, wait, wait a second, you know, I, are you sure you want to do that? You know? How far, Heidegger says, how far are you going to try to put your faith in science? And I had, I had a conversation, um, I, I, I gave some lectures about similar issues in the photographer's gallery last year. And, uh, and uh, it was very interesting to see how deeply ingrained our deep faith and trust in the scientific process. We just want to have answers and we want to arrive at them logically and rationally. And you kind of ask yourself, how far can we prepare to trust this method? You know, until the last blade of grass is fed to the last cow, until the last human, you know, takes their last breath of air, you know, even then we will still trust science because this is the surest model we have. Even when we can see, you know, even when there is no one left to see that this method is also destroying the very place, the very thing that is us. And it seems that, you know, it's, it's, we kind of come to a point, and for Heidegger we're already inhabiting this point in which what science demands and what life needs are in conflict, which is of course a paradox not lost to Heidegger because in a sense the whole scientific push begins from the need to feel secure. 
yeah? And this need to feel secure <coughs> gets us on the precipice of a nuclear holocaust, yeah? Why we have the nuclear bomb? Because we want to be secure, you know? It used to be called during the Cold War, and probably it will come back uh, into the next country again, MAD, M-A-D, Mutually Assured Destruction. Mutually assured destruction is the base, the best guarantee we have for being safe. Man. Yeah, nice to act. So, okay, uh, where are we now? How are we doing with this so far? Is it kind of opening up some doors of perception? Yeah? It does, isn't it? It's interesting. Uh, the thing you think had was many things he says kind of seem quite um, familiar. But that's because Heidegger wrote in the 50s, he was, as I already indicated, deeply um, relevant to the whole postmodern movement. For instance, you can see how the Green movement and the notion of Gaia and this sense of shared responsibility between us and the world is very much coming up, you will see it better later, it's very much coming up the way Heidegger wants us to renegotiate our relationship with things. He basically said, as long as you look at things scientifically, you will get the jug as a vessel that holds set the volume, but you will not get what it means in your life. And also, as long as you look at the earth, forget the jug, the earth, the world, as long as you look at the earth scientifically, then you might say, well, yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, gas here under our feet, and let's do some fracking, and let's extract it, and that will convert to uh, petrodollars and uh, wealth but and projects. Science and fiscal, um, you know, kind of game, I guess? Yes. Fiscal fiscal. And what do you think? I don't know, I'm asking you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The same thing. Yes, it's the same thing. Um, he did the same thing because science is in the service of uh, industry, of capitalism, um, of, uh, you know, yeah, profit. So, uh, but the point is, the point is not that. The point is that as long as we look at the earth scientifically, we end up looking at it in terms of the energy we can extract and the resources we have. And this is all very well, yeah, because this trip, we can do it, we can go faster, we can play better games, we can have more events of virtual reality, and we can have tasty sandwiches and all of that, you know. It's all kind of really great. But while all of this is taking place, we never stop to realize that actually we are not here to exploit the earth of the results. We are here to look after it. Because only by looking after it do we end up looking after ourselves. You know? And and that's why, for instance, the argument for fracking is so compelling. Because the, the profit is undeniable. And then we will come and we will say, well, yeah, look, but we, we need to look after this track of land. Well, it's kind of ridiculous to so, so, you know, hippie talk. But the hippie movement is on some, you know, through a tense degree of separation, is linked to Heidegger's concern of how we forgot where we belong. We forgot that we are actually, we have a responsibility to this thing on which we live because we are part of it. So the question of the journal is, how is it part of us? So just cutting to the chase, and I will try to do it in the next few minutes, I don't think it will be more than uh, necessary. Uh, Let's go to page 11. Uh, and suddenly, we are here in the, um, we kind of already abandoned the scientific discourse of the job. And now Heidegger offers us a different approach to grasping where the job is. Um, could someone read to us? Quickly. Please. <coughs> I will, uh, sorry, I will uh, make it a bit easier. 
The gift of the poor is a libation for the mortals. It quenches their thirst. It enlivens their efforts. It heightens their sociability. But the gift of the jug is also at times given for consecration. If the poor is for consecration, then it does not appease the thirst. It appeases the celebration of the festival on high. Now the gift of the poor is neither given in a tavern, nor is the gift a libation for mortals. The poor is, the poor is the oblation spent for the immortal gods. The gift of the poor as oblation is the authentic gift. In the giving of the consecrated oblation, the poor and jug essences as the giving gift. Okay, like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> It was all very well while we were in the domain of representation, even criticizing representation. We felt quite comfortable because criticizing representation is still representation. We didn't go anywhere by saying, oh, bad representation, look what you does to us. It's still representation. Suddenly, like, Heidegger takes us into a completely different world of libation. What is libation? Do you know what is libation? It's when you make a sacrifice um, and in, in, in the Greek ancient tradition, let's say, if you slaughter a cow, then you take a piece of meat and you put on the sacred fire. It's an offering. It's an offering, yeah. Or, or you know, if, if, even if you, these days, if you go to, um, to a grave of a friend, you might pour some whiskey, you know. That's a libation. What's yeah? consecration? What is consecration? It's making something sacred. Consecrated ground, let's say. Um, the consecrated church is to call. Yesterday there was a uh, diktat from uh, Vatican that uh, Catholics are not allowed to keep ashes of loved ones at home and they have to bury it in consecrated ground. Why? The Catholic Church is worried that people will, be, will develop pagan tendencies by like keeping the, the ashes of the loved ones at home that might become objects of worship, as they happen in Japan, I think. Isn't that the case that in Japan um, there is a kind of a cult of the ancestors and then become, so like, they don't want this competition, you know? There is only one place where you can have this sort of feelings and it is in the, in the consecrated ground of the graveyard. And the I digress. Let's, let's go close here. Because Russia, this thing is, is not good. I'm going to take another few more minutes because we need to get this out and be very clear about the other method Heidegger is talking about. So the rational method, we can see why it is not working. The, the judge has an object. What Heidegger offers instead, and this is the essence of phenomenology. And Heidegger is often known as a phenomenology. So I think I want you through that to understand how phenomenology operates and why is it different from Cartesian rational thinking or idealism or Platonism. Heidegger says the question is not what can you tell about scientifically or representation. The question is what does it do in your life? If I come, if I knock on your door after a long journey and I'm thirsty, and I'm asking for something to drink. And you will tell me, oh, wait while I replace one volume in this jar with another volume. You know, what are you talking about? I'm thirsty. I need, I need some water. Bring me some water. If you talk to me about volumes, you know, it's just completely not the right thing. I need to drink. And when you bring me the jar of water, you basically bring me life. You offer me a respite from suffering, you know? And if you know what it's like to feel thirsty, it is a real, it's a, to it's a torture. There's no other word for it. To feel thirst is a real torture. And then you see this jug of water. Do you really care about the volume? Do you really care? So, oh, you know, but could you give me the, kind of the well, what is exactly the physical weight of the jug? Or how, how much it is it? Oh, no, you just want to feel the water on your lips, and you know that with that will come life, with that will come pleasure, yeah? So this, Heidegger says, that's what the jag really means. 
The essence of the jar is that it can offer you life. It can offer, if, if it is water. It can offer you also death if it's poison. Yeah? But that what it means to you in your life. Now, it also might mean other things. What do you think? Why do we have a jar? Why do we have a jar in our life? What, what did we have before we had a jar? What is the most basic form of a jar? That's right, yeah. Before there was a jar, you would go to the river, you would take some water and you drink like this, yeah, from your hands. And then someone thought of making that from clay, or from wood, or from grass, or whatever. So the jar is really your cup hands held together. Because this notion of grabbing some water in your hands and offering it or drinking from it is something that you do as a human being. As a human being, you offer, you keep for yourself, you keep for others. So the jar appears to us in a completely new capacity as an extension of ourselves, not as something that we are set over against in the subject-object relationship, but the, the jar is my own hands made of clay. Yeah? But, but, but more than that, I am, it is in my nature, it, what makes me a human being is that if I see you thirsty, I will offer you water. That's what makes me human. That's part of my humanity. And when you come to my house and I put a jug of wine on the table and I invite you to partake in the wine and in the conversation, um, the jar becomes part of how our social fabric is held together. Yeah? So again, it's not the scientific analysis told us nothing about what it actually means in my life. In my life, the jar means friendship, welcoming, offering, gifting, um, intoxication, all these things. You know, that's what life is made of, of these things. So that's why the scientific method gave me a description of the jar, but killed or annihilated its real meaning in my life. Yes? Um, all of this, uh, the words that you use in are very spiritual. Yes, but, but no, yes, but no. Uh, it's both. Is, it, is friendship spiritual? No, I, I'm sort of like talking about giving the gift. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, 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 will get, I will get to that in a minute because I don't, I don't want you to think that Heidegger somehow going back to Christianity. He's not offering us another religion here. Not at all, not at all. He's the same, same kind of slightly different, but let's hear it a, a little bit better. I leave the jack for a second. The question is, what street you are you live in? What, what is the name of the street you live in? Street. 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 What road do you live in? Sheriff. 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 Yeah. What road do you live in? Yes. What road do you live in? Victoria Road. Victoria Road. What road do you live in? Okay. What is your road? You know? Well, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, can, we, we have a name for the road. We can even go to the dictionary and find the definition of the road. But what the road really means to me is that it takes me to the tube station. It takes me to meet other people. It allows me to go to the shop and buy my groceries. It allows me to make contact with other people. The, the, the role of the street in my life is not that it has a certain name and a certain definition. It connects me with other human beings because to connect with other human beings is what I do as a human. Yeah? I have projects. As long as I am alive, what do, when you see someone walking on the street, what does it mean? They always go somewhere. They're always on the way. Why? Because we always have projects. It might be, I need to finish this MA. I need to go buy, buy a stamp and send a letter. I need to go to the bank and pay a bill. We always have 
different projects. 